Hello everyone, this is John Erickson and I'm going to talk a little bit about the new proposed golf ball um, and the controversy that's swirling around this. Um, I, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I got several emails, maybe four or five from my uh, students and some of the YouTube people like, you know, knowing my position on things, you know, being the last remaining purist in the game, I guess. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, I know I, I, I do know what to say. I know what to say. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Um, all right. So let, let's start with what the, the official uh, um, press release on this. So St. Andrew, Andrew's governing body has been seriously looking into the issue for six years. So that's since 2017. Okay, 2017, they're deciding it's a problem. Okay. Um, and they announced they were conducting a joint report and three years ago, their Distance Insight project concluded that the ever increasing length pros are hitting the golf ball is detrimental to the game. Okay, detrimental to the game. Um, <clears throat> So uh, let me get this straight. So the, the golf ball is going 50 yards farther than it used to go than the era when I played. So I, I played at the end of the persimmon blade balada era. I mean, you can throw in the early metal woods. They, they played the same as the persimmons. The only reason that people would use a tailor-made burner, you could hit it off the fairway into a par five and you know, had a lower uh, center of gravity so you could get a little loft on it. <clears throat> the ball didn't go any farther than a persimmon driver. It wasn't until the Big Bertha came out and, you know, I I'll say the story one more time. I was at PJ Tour School playing with uh, who would later become British, o British Open champion Todd Hamilton and Todd and I played, you know, in the same era. And he had just come back from Japan with this huge headed driver, this graphite I think it was a Yonix. It was all graphite and a shaft. And uh, he had you know, won over there once or twice in Japan with this new driver. And he said it saved his game. And you know, he was telling me about how great it was. And you know, Todd and I hit it about the same. You know, we were kind of you know, a little more than uh, average. You know, I would say in the probably the uh, 75th percentile maybe. You know, always 25% you know, guys longer than me. <clears throat> but I was a little longer than average. Um, so he's hitting this club and he's hitting it like 20, 25 yards by me now with this club and we're at PGA Tour School. And I'm thinking, what? You know, how, how is this club legal? How is the USGA allowing this golf club to be used in the event? I mean, it would be like if a, a professional baseball player came out and instead of a wood bat, he's got a titanium bat or a graphite or composite or something. And the bat, instead of it being this wide around, is now this wide around. And maybe it's even longer or whatever. And that person is now, you know, hitting, you know, an extra 20 or 30 home runs a year or whatever. I mean, you know, I think there'd be an uproar about that. There should have been an uproar about this back then. <clears throat> okay, but here we are now, 2017, and St. Andrew's governing body has decided that uh, the new the ball is uh, detrimental to the game. I don't think the issue is the ball. I think they're barking up the wrong tree. I don't think it has anything to do with the ball. This has to do with the driver, okay, that are 45, six, seven inch, however long these clubs are, however light they are, and the size of the head allows these players to just take an ungodly rip at it. You can swing as hard as you possibly can, and you don't have to worry about missing the golf ball or not making good contact or whatever. There have been studies that are showing the ball being hit all over the face and it's still, you know, flying, um, you know, tremendous distances, not, not really that much distance loss. So the, the, the problem is the club. It's the driver. Uh, I still play persimmon. And I use the modern ball because the old balladas are just, they're no good anymore. The rubber bands have gone bad inside and, and they're not really, uh, you know, they're not really playable. And 
I don't hit the modern ball that much farther than a, a old Bellotta ball. Nice, uh, you know, we were playing, uh, I was playing the Maxfly HT, or sometimes if I was playing Titleist, we play, I think it was the 384 uh, or the, the Titleist Professional golf ball, Bellotta wound ball. And we had guys hitting 300 yard drives then, but the ball spun a lot more. So if you hit it a little offline, it was two fairways over. I mean, it would just keep keep going sideways. So <sighs> there's so much to talk about here. But um, yeah, the, the, the golf ball is the least of the problems. Um, the driver is what's causing the problem. The, uh, the clubs are too long and they're too light and the, uh, I give the credit to the scientists, the scientific community for figuring out how they can make these clubs and the golf ball work together to hit the ball as far as possible with the trampoline effect coming off the club face and, and all these kind of things. Um, you know, that, yeah, the technology, if that's the goal is to hit the ball as, as far as possible, if golf is a, you know, a long drive contest or whatever, then, then they're doing a great job with that. But to sit there and say now, oh, now there's a problem. I mean, this was a problem in the late 90s. Um, my friend and contemporary uh, Bradley Hughes, you know, uh, talked about, I think he led the PGA Tour in total driving, which is a combination of uh, distance and, uh, and fairways hit. And uh, I think he led the tour in 97, I think he said, 96, 97. And then they came out with uh, <clears throat> some advancements in the technology, and they changed the ball, and there were some new clubs that came out. And then suddenly, you know, he, his statistics were the same, and a bunch of people just passed him up or whatever because of the, the technology. He didn't change. He stayed where he was at with what he was doing. Everyone else was doing something else. And then, so, but th right around that time, um, you know, Tiger Woods came onto the scene. Tiger hit the ball 30, 40 yards farther than other players were at the time. And uh, that's great because it was done with technique, you know, as fantastic. I mean, there's no argument against that. But it was then uh, with the advancements in technology where now everybody's starting to hit the ball farther. And I wasn't really playing a lot of golf at the time, but I know that watching the Masters, uh, because that would be a, the same golf course every year that were, as compared with, uh, you say, the US Open where they're changing venues or the PGA or the British. But what I noticed is that um, occasionally, that's kind of the only thing I would watch. It would be maybe the Masters uh, when I wasn't playing. I, I didn't play for 13 years after I retired for the tour. And uh, I remember, you know, the, the 10th and 11th holes were long irons. You know, you hit driver and a long iron into those holes. And if you, on 10, if you could turn it a little bit around the corner and catch a downslope, you could maybe come in there with a five or a six iron or something so there was kind of a risk and reward if you could hit that perfect shot and catch the slope and run it down a little bit and uh, the 11th hole was always a drive and a four iron or three iron or something I think Ben Hogan made the comment you know, said you know if you see me on the green I missed the shot or whatever you know, you, you know I don't know how true that was if you actually try and miss the green but, but it, basically what he was saying is coming in there with a long iron and a very difficult shot into that green and then I noticed uh, in the you know, early, early 2000s. I mean, they're hitting wedges, wedges into 10 and 11. In fact, I even saw in the early 2000s, I think Phil Mickelson hitting a wedge into the 13th hole, the par five. Uh, a lot of guys hitting, you know, short irons, nine irons, eight irons. Um, is, is that upholding the value in the integrity of the game by allowing that to happen. I mean, th this this conversation, this needed to happen a long time ago. Th this whole idea that suddenly there's now a problem, uh, that this, uh, that the, let me read this again. The Distance Insight Project concluded that the ever-increasing length pros are hitting it is detrimental to the game. So it's suddenly, it's detrimental to the game. In, in what way? I mean, you've got a whole generation of players that have grown up with the modern technology now. They don't know Persimmon Woods. They don't know that the golf ball used to go 250 yards and not 300 yards or 350 yards. They don't know that we used to have to carry two iron, three iron, four iron, maybe even a one iron, uh, a four wood. Um, 
so a, a golf course that would you know be typically defined by the uh, the par fours on the golf course. You're going to have your four par threes typically, par seventy two, your four par fives, and your ten par fours. And of those ten par fours, you would have three or four long ones, meaning two, three, and four iron approach shots, maybe even a fairway wood. And then you would have three or four mid irons, uh, mid length holes, which would uh, require that you hit in a five, six, and a seven iron. And then your short par fours, which would be your eight, nine, and wedge. So any mixture of that, a long course might have, have four long ones and uh, you know three, three short, three short ones so mid ones yeah it, the, the shorter courses would have maybe one long par four or two you know but the really long courses would have four so like four times you're having to pull out a long iron approach shot into a par four so the whole idea the original integrity and the value uh, the valuation of the shots was to be tested uh, the skill set right across the whole bag uh, the hardest shot in golf would be hitting a long iron off the fairway into a green. So on a par five, if you could hit a long enough drive and you were back there with a heavily guarded green, maybe there's water in the front or heavily bunkered or something like that, a small green, and you have to make a decision. Do I go for this green with a two iron coming in with a low trajectory, a bun bunch of bunkers around there, maybe water? Uh, and the green's kind of kind of shallow from front to back. Very risky. Or yeah, see they they, they don't like this. <laughs> they don't like this either. Um, so do you, do you come in there with a low trajectory shot, take that risk, or do you lay up short and and hit a, a wedge shot in? Maybe you you want to lay up uh, you know 50 yards back. Some people felt like they could put more spin on it from 80 or 100 yards back and depending on the pin placement, all this strategy. So these great classic courses, I mean, bless the last gener or two couple generations ago now for making these amazing golf courses, uh, securing the property rights and dealing with whatever they had to deal with to you know, create the Monterey Peninsula. I mean, all these golf courses right on the ocean, you could never get permits to do anything like that now. I mean, we should hold in reverence these, these golf courses. I don't think they should be run over by technology to where you know pros are hitting 350 yard drives or amateurs or anyone should be hitting the ball that far um, it, it, it doesn't make any sense uh, I think it's the original architects that designed these courses I can't you know imagine they would be happy about that uh, there's a lot of articulation that goes into designing these golf courses you know the angles you know golf is golf is a game a game of strategy and position and deciding you know which side of the fairway to go down and how far to go down and is there a flat spot that we're aiming towards down the left side and if I go down the right side I, yeah, I can get closer but I'm gonna side hill lie and I'm gonna have a hanging lie into this pin placement or whatever and all these options but with a really great golf course designers <clears throat> they spent the time to really figure this stuff out and give the player a lot of risk and reward and strategy and options for playing these courses and uh, the bunkering off the tee you know a typical bunker might be you know 230 yards off the tee so to carry it you know 250 yard drive would typically be you know a 230 carry and 20 yards a roll so it was kind of risky to try and cut a corner over a bunker they positioned these just perfectly to where the the typical you know good player good amateur player or professional would have to think like, do I wanna try and go over that bunker? And if I don't, I'm in the bunker and it's got a pretty big lip on, I'm gonna have to just kind of wedge out into the fair. It's gonna cost me probably a shot. Do I wanna risk that? Uh, maybe coming down the stretch? Yeah, you do wanna risk that. It's kind of exciting. I'm trying to make birdie coming in here. But if the ball's going 50 yards farther, that doesn't even come into play. So what do they do? Oh, well, let's move the tees back 50 yards. Oh, okay, we got room on this hole. Yeah, we can move the tees back 50 yards. But, but here's the problem. You know, um, these holes were also meant for shot shape. Okay, so to draw the ball off the tee or to fade the ball off the tee and work it around a bunker, around a corner and all that. But if you just move the tees back 50 yards, then it just becomes a straight shot to the corner. You're not shaping the ball to the corner. 
And because the modern ball doesn't spin as much as the Bellatas, um, you know, that takes that out of it. So just a high straight shot to the corner, that, that's not what this game was about. The, the great game was about shaping it and curving it and having a high spinning ball. We used to want to play as high spinning a ball as possible because we would use the spin to our advantage. As a good player, you, would, you wanted to be able to curve the ball a lot. And if you were a good player and you had control of the golf ball, then that wasn't a problem. And, and the golfers that weren't so good, they shied away from the high spinning ball and they would play golf balls like top flights and pinnacles or these low spinning balls that maybe they go a little farther, but I never remembered a tour player winning a golf tournament with a top flight. I mean, you literally just couldn't do it because you, you needed a skill set above and beyond just hitting the ball far. You had to shape and curve the ball and all that. And when, when I was playing on tour, the shape of the ball, it would, it would it would go up to its apex and it would continue to curve down all the way to the green or to the fairway. But the modern ball, and you can see this on TV, you turn on the TV, you see the ball, they can shape it, shape it up to the apex, but then it falls, it tends to fall straight down, it just loses its spin and it just it just falls like this, where we were able to continue that curve. So these are the, the real issues that should be addressed with the golf ball about spin. Uh, what they should be doing is putting the spin back on the ball. I mean, if they, if they want to do something with the ball, put the spin back on it. Um, I don't think the golf ball, the, the, the distance that the ball's traveling uh, is not so much the issue. Um, if, if, if they were to take the golf club and say, okay, uh, this is the limit of what the club can be. It can only be you know, 43 inches or 44 inches, put somewhere in there, 40, 43, 43 and a half, 44 inches. The head can only be, well, the classic persimmon head, but it's very simple. They were three inches wide and two inches high, and then they would have some drivers that would be two and a half, the deep face, two and a half inches deep, but they were th three inches wide. So if they just put a limit on the surface area, then it would require precision, and you would think, hmm, I can't swing as hard as I want at it because I'm going to lose control, and if you have a high spinning ball and you hit it out on the toe, you're, you're two fairways over. I mean, it, it's... So it was much more a game of precision. Now let's talk about this for a second. They call golf a game, but they call golf a sport. A sport, you know, you see it on the sports page, golf, golf, golf. But is golf really a sport? Well, I think it now, I think for the last 20 years or so, it's been a sport. Um, but when I was playing, it was, it was a game. In fact, I think if you look up the definition even today, if you look up any of the popular uh, dictionaries, Merriam-Webster or whatever, uh, I think you're going to see golf categorized as, as a game. So what's the difference between a game and a sport? Well, a game doesn't necessarily require any uh, great physical attributes or whatever. It, it's kind of open to everybody. You know, anyone can play the game. I mean, we can sit down and play chess. It doesn't matter whether you weigh 300 pounds and you know, have trouble walking across the room without losing your breath or whatever. I mean, there's no athletic necessity to playing, you know, Monopoly or, you know, whatever, you know, board, board games, um, poker, card games, all these kind of things are, are, are games. Um, you know, uh, lawn bowling and th 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 things like this. I always think golf was a, a game in the sense that you only really needed to hit the ball. I mean, the average tour player was hitting the ball 250 yards and, and when I was playing. And, and I'm considering this era basically to be the 70 years of the classic game. If we say the uh, persimmon era uh, steel shafts from 1930s up into the 1990s, you know, mid 30s, 1990s. Before that, you had the Hickory era. You know, Bobby Jones was said to have hit 300 yard drives of the Hickory Club. The, the Hickory era, you know, the argument I hear, oh, why don't, you know, John, you know, you're out of date, you're out of touch, you know, you we might as well just roll it back to the Hickory era and everyone just go back and wear a coat and tie and play Hickory clubs or whatever. And uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> I think it would be better to do that than, than the direction that it is going. Um, but the, the what the Hickory, what, what steel shafts did is it allowed uh, a player to have a shaft with, I mean, a, a club, a club set with consistent shaft flexes. You know, I, I've got a hickory set, and I can hit the hickory five iron uh, 
just as far as I can my five iron with a, with a steel shaft is no real difference. No, no significant difference in there. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the steel shafts allowed for the shafts to, to move the game in technological advancement towards more accuracy. Okay. And as the ball got better and more spinnier for the good player, more maneuverability, accuracy, shot shaping, and this sort of thing. That's where I think technology should be used in golf to help us hit the ball straighter, to be able to work the ball more, uh, to be able to utilize the, uh, the different angles and things, strategies that we want to do to play the golf course. That's what makes golf uh, interesting, golf as a game. Uh, so if the average tour pro hit the ball 250 yards and your uh, club, uh, club champion player at, at the local course, uh, the kind of the guy who hit it straight and short, maybe he was hitting it 235, you know, off the tee. And, uh, you know, my, uh, take my dad for per perfect example. So my dad was a seven time, seven or eight time club champion, uh, plus one handicap, very good player, short hitter, relatively short hitter, straight hitter, kind of like a Tom Kite kind of player, uh, just hit a lot of fairways and greens. And uh, we just kind of nickel and dime people to death. I mean, longer players are missing shots and getting in trouble, and my dad was just boom, 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 you know. And uh, but you know, my dad, you know, he worked a you know a nine to five job, and he played on the weekends, you know. And uh, he wasn't going to the gym or anything like that. He kept himself in you know decent shape by playing golf. He always walked, always walked the golf course for exercise. He'd play. He would play Saturday and Sunday, so he played 36 holes. A, a week and uh, when we would go to the LA Open and you know my dad had played Riviera and you know Pebble Beach and stuff and and we would watch certain players and he'd be like yeah that's kind of right where I hit it you know or he goes yeah I could you know hit it right where Tom Kite's hitting it there he could you could feel a sense of connection to the game like your your good player a short hitter at the at the club could say yeah there's a guy on tour that's just like me like if I could learn to hit my irons a little more accurate or chip and putt a little bit better I mean heck Maybe I could be a touring pro or I could qualify for the LA Open on Monday and get in and win a check or something like that. You, you could feel a connection to the game. Um, for even the, you know, round the club short hitters, it, it wasn't like an impossible thing in your mind. Even if it was just kind of a fantasy, it was still kind of there. Like there's kind of a reality to that. Like you could, I, I could see myself hitting the ball that far. You only really needed to hit the ball maybe 235 yards and you're in the game i mean at any level you know us open if you could hit it 235 and in the fairway every time you could in theory win a us open you know you were in the game so what did it take to uh hit the ball that far some good technique some decent technique but you didn't have to be going to the gym and working out that sort of thing i think nowadays it's it's kind of a requirement that uh you're able to hit the ball 300 yards, you know, if you're going to have a serious shot at the PGA Tour or the Corn Ferry Tour or whatever they're, they're playing now. Um, so there's a real disconnect now between amateur golf and professional golf. Your typical amateur just, you know, watches Dustin Johnson hitting 350 yard drives. It's just like, what? You know, um, you, know it, you just know you're never going to be able to do that. It's a whole nother thing. So it, it's kind of like what happened when, when they started stretching the distances out with uh, the, the the driver the mainly the driver and the golf ball to some extent a lesser extent but if you were to say you know here's a guy who hits it 230 here's a guy who hits it 240 so here's a guy who hits a 250 the average tour player 260 and the longest guys are hitting it 270 okay but they're all kind of within reach of each other I mean a guy at 230 and a guy at 270, that's, you know, 40 yards. So, but the guy at 270 is kind of wild off the tee. So you felt like if I hit all the fairways and this guy is missing six or seven fairways, I can beat this guy. But what's happened as they've stretched this out. So now with the ball going farther, the, the, these, this incremental distance between what used to be these 10 yards from the short hitter, the guy 230, to the medium short hitter 240, to the medium hitter 250, to the little longer hitters 260, 270, is now over here. So we've stretched it out and now they're bigger jumps. We're, we're talking like 20, 
30 yard increments you know between these these players so your short hitter isn't really gaining that much but your long hitter the guy hitting it that used to hit at 270 is now hitting at 350 you know so um you, you know your short hitter is going from maybe 230 to 250 he's picking up 20 yards but the guy at 270 is hitting it you know 320 or something he's picking up 50 yards so you're even farther back behind so what it did by making the ball go farther by the driver really is the is the, the main culprit here by doing that that's what's created this disconnection here that's what is not good for the game so getting back to golf as a game is golf a game or is it a sport well again it's still defined as a game so no real physical attributes required to play golf we've had short players short thin players like chichi rodriguez or mike reed people that hit it not real far but straight and then you've had tall players like george archer uh, george bear were you know six six or something uh, tall thin guys uh, you've had you know there, there were uh Bob Murphy, uh, Craig Stadler, Roger Malpe, the era's the 70s players that had beer guts and looked like, I mean, I think, uh, was it Roger Malpe carried like a Michelob bag, you know, like beer on his advertising, you know what I mean? And it, it, the thing, the, the beauty of that is that you could be sitting in your living room watching golf on Sunday and you could say, that there's a guy like me, like that, you know, it looks like my neighbor cutting his lawn out there, you know? Um, you know, his guy's got a beer guy. He's got a cat. He's walking the course. I mean, it's not that hard to just walk around a golf course. You know, you just, it's not an athletic thing. It's not a sport. You just need to get, be able to walk. You know, if you can just walk and figure out some good technique, get the club shaft and the club head working through the ball correctly, then you could be in the game regardless of your, you know, physical attributes or whatever. And I think that was a beautiful, wonderful thing when golf was a game. In other words, it's a game. Anyone that can learn to just, if you can get the ball out there 235 yards, you're in the game. You're in the game. You're at any level, you're in the game. No disconnect there. Of course, it's an advantage to hit the ball far and straight. And, you know, someone like Greg Norman comes along to get hit, you know, 280 yard drives, sometimes 300 yard drives with a persimmon and blotta and straight, pretty straight. So that's an advantage. And, yeah, he was number one in the world, wasn't he? So he did it with skill, you know, and uh, that separated himself from other players. Sam Snead was said to have been the same way in his era. Very long, big, strong guy, hit it hit it far and straight. Um, Jack Nicholas, great driver of the ball, hit the ball far and straight and had an advantage. So that's all, you know, based on skill. Uh, but the majority of the guys were hitting it 250, and there were plenty of times, and the majority of times, I mean, Jack Nicholas didn't win every tournament that he played in. In fact, he won you know, a relatively small percentage of the tournaments that he played in. The tournaments that were being won were uh, guys like Billy Casper that, you know, led uh, the tour in money earnings several times in the 1960s as a short hitter, you know. And he was the one, you know, winning the most money and won, you know, tons of tournaments. And so it just kind of allowed everybody into the game. So now it's moved into being a sport. So the courses have got longer. And uh, the typical U.S. Open course that sat at 6,800 yards, 68, 6,900 yards, 250-yard drives. Guys are having to hit long irons. And you know, to me, it was exciting to see the drama when a player pulls out a, you know, a two-iron or a three-iron into a par four. And getting back to the architecture of these holes, so, you know, the 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 great architects are just just common sense architecture would be that if you're coming in to a green with a long iron, meaning it's gonna have a lower trajectory, low trajectory shot into the green, you would, you would design the green so it would be deeper from front to back so that it would be able to accept a lower trajectory shot. If you I'll go back to Augusta, 10 and 11 at Augusta, uh, long irons into those holes. Uh, those greens are deep and you would skip the ball in, you'd hit it, it would hit in the front part of the green, it would hit, kind of skip in, or, even land short of the green and roll onto the green. Uh, it was kind of skip it in. It wasn't until the early 2000s that, you know, when I saw guys down there hitting wedges and 
eight, nine, eight iron, and they're hitting the on the green and spinning the ball back. I mean, that no one ever spun the ball back on those holes. Never, because you're coming in with a long iron or a forward or even a three wood. You're coming in with a low trajectory shot, the ball bouncing and skipping on the green. But the green was designed to accept that kind of a shot. Now, if you take 13 and 15 at Augusta, they're par fives and they're kind of almost like the same length holes, really. This may be a tad bit longer. But those greens were wide but, but shallow. So when you're coming in with that so-called low trajectory shot into a par five, you're going to take that risk and try and get it over Race Creek with a two iron or a three iron or four wood. I'm going to come in there with a low trajectory shot and the green's not that deep. Well, it's risky. Yeah, yeah, you got to hit a perfect shot. Perfect, perfect. It's got to come in there and land right on that front part of the green. It's got to get over Race Creek. It's got to hit in the front part of the green. It can't be coming in there too hot. You can't hit it towards the back of the green. You can go over and then you're in big trouble because then you're chipping back and you're coming downhill. Uh, there, I think there isn't there water over the green on 15 too at, at Augusta, so you don't want to mess with that. So um, yeah, it, trajectory and the, uh, the, the intention of the game and the design of the architecture and how far the ball traveled and your options for going down which side of the fairway and your angles and pin placements and this is all about the game the game of golf there's no reason that golf courses needed to be lengthened by 500 yards i mean it, it just doesn't make any sense you know especially in this day of you know environmentalism and everybody's you know upset even if a golf course is being built somewhere you got people protesting or whatever um, and using more fertilizer the maintenance costs are much more to uh, handle uh, on a, a golf course it just takes up more acreage um, it, it, it doesn't make any sense I mean if you look at other sports I mean you know football you have a hundred yard you know American football hundred yard gridiron uh, you know basketball you have a court you know tennis I mean you know games are sports sport slash games or whatever um, not huge playing fields with with golf, we're talking about, you know, enormous, enormous playing fields. Do they need to be more enormous? I mean, it, how does how does that make any sense? Any sense at all? It makes no sense. None. Zero. Okay, but somebody decided, you know, at the ruling bodies here that it did make sense. So let's just let the cat out of the bag in 1998. I think it may be even a little bit before that, the Big Bertha and all this. They should have capped it back then, but they didn't. So the cat's out of the bag. The cat is so far out of the bag now, we don't even know where the cat is. We don't even know if the cat's in the neighborhood anymore. Is it even in, in the city? Is it even in the county? Is this cat even in the country? Is it even alive? I mean, this cat's been out of the bag since, two, you know, uh, 1996, 97, 98. Um, to, to say that now we have a problem that needs to be, I mean, <laughs> okay, uh, what? Now? I, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, uh, the, the game as it's being played now, it is, it's something that has been created. This quote problem was created and then you have a whole generation of golfers learning this new super golf modern game and that's the kids that's what they grow up with you know um that would be like me learning to play golf you know with persimmon and blades and then you know i'm halfway into my pro career and they say yeah we're changing this now and you know we're gonna you know make you do play a totally different game you know you can't hit it the ball as far we're gonna change you know your clubs we're gonna change the ball you're gonna have to use a hockey stick or whatever you know or whatever um no, it's, it's too late. It's just too late, too late to change this now. So I would say that um, if, if they really cared about the integrity of the game and all this sort of thing, and they want to grow the game, it's not to grow the game more with longer drivers and balls that go farther and all that. Just leave that alone, you know, and create or promote the classic game, okay? Just say, okay, PJ Tour, USGA, they're going to play this. You know, you got the modern game, Super Golf or whatever. And then we will have the United States Persimmon and Blade Championship. Okay? And we'll have the United States Hickory Golf Championship. So, why not have grow the game sideways? So, to give room 
And why not have a tour where you have a persimmon and blade tour, the ball goes 250 yards, you play the classic tracks just as the great generations did, it'd be great. I mean, one of the reasons I play persimmon and blades is because I like to keep the historical relevance for me. If I go uh, play a, a great classic course and I shoot 68 and I can see that, wow, I played just as good as Jack Nicholas did or Ben Hogan did here, you know, 70, 50, 70 years ago or whatever. I, I, it gives me a better feeling to walk off the course knowing that I played the same equipment and gear that they did. And it gives relevance to me. It gives me a better feeling like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm in this. I got this, you know, it's good. Now, if I go out there and I'm hitting the ball 50 yards farther and I come in and I shoot 65 or something, oh, look what I, look what I did. I'm so great. I'm so amazing. I mean, really? I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding myself here, right? I'm not going to kid myself. I don't want to play that game within my own mind. Uh, I want to know that if my skill set is uh, equal to on that particular day, if I can go around this golf course and play as good as Ken Venturi did on this course, had the course record at, at Northwood or whatever, and I come within a shot of that or something, it's like, I played pretty good here, you know? But if I go out and I'm hitting the ball 50 yards farther, really? No, 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 that's, that's not that's not right. So um, that's kind of my, my thoughts on this. I think that the issue is really not the ball that much. Um, you know, I don't like the modern ball. I feel like it hurts me, actually, because I can't spin the ball the way I used to. I, my, my thought process going into a green, I used to think of the shape as the ball's coming into the green, coming in, you know, drawing the ball in or fading the ball in. And I always thought about what the ball's gonna do after it hits and when it hits the green. Am I gonna spin it to the left? Am I gonna spin it back and, and move it this way? Am I gonna spin it to the right? Am I gonna come in with a low shot? and have it bounce once or twice and then stop? Uh, am I gonna just try and come in high? And all these options about having the ability to put a lot of spin on the ball, that was, that's a good thing for, for good players that have good ball control. So uh, yeah, I don't like the modern ball, but it's not because it goes too far, it's because it doesn't spin and I, and I can't shape the ball like I used to. So I'm having, I can still shape it some, yes, but not like I used to. I can't think like I used to, like coming into the green, hitting the green, and it's gonna, as it hits, it's gonna move to the left after it hits and I can spin it back into a you know, front left pin placement or something like that. Now they just come in with wedges and go right at the pin, it just drops in, it's very boring. I mean, if, if you played the old game with all the articulations and everything, uh, I mean, I, that's why I don't really watch the modern golf. It's not any disrespect to the young players. I, I feel bad for them that they didn't get the experience that I did. You know, to really, to play the deep articulations of the game, golf was, an incredible game. Now, because I, it being a sport, I mean, it's categorized as a sport. Um, it, it really is a sport. I mean, you have guys working out in the gym, and they're hitting, you know, hitting, trying to get their club head speed up to uh, you know, 120, 125 miles an hour or whatever. Um, you know, these are uh, athletic endeavors, and and bravo for them to be able to do this, to train and to be able to, to do this, and to be able to hit the ball 350 yards. I don't think that should be taken away from them. You know, because that's what they're playing. They're playing the sport of golf and not the game of golf. So I think there's room to grow the grow the game. You know, they keep saying it's good for the game. No, no, it's not. This isn't good for the game. It's good for the sport. I think we really need to, you know, focus on that sport versus game. Are we talking golf as a game? Or are we talking golf as a sport? Because if it's a sport, then working out, hitting it as far as possible. Um, the golf courses are much wider open than they used to be at the pro level. When I watch t TV golf, it, 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 the ferries are so wide compared to what they used to be. And the rough just isn't really that long anymore. And you know, if you're hitting a wedge out of some light rough, I mean, you just assume be 100 yards from the green, then back 150 yards from the green in the middle of the fairway. And that, that's not right. That's not good for the game. It might be good for the sport, but not the game. So anyway, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, there's not really much else I can say. I, I'm not, um, I'm disappointed in the big picture, of course, going way back. Like, I never would have imagined golf would have turned into what it's turned into, gone from a game to a sport. Um, and, and it just eliminates a lot of, a lot of people that, that could be enjoying the game even at a professional level. You just don't see the short hitters out there anymore, you know, doing so well. Guys hitting it 250 off the tee or 230 or something. You know, 
this just doesn't even exist. So I think that's unfortunate. But anyway, yeah, it is what it is. Um, they're going to do what they're going to do. But um, I, I still, you know, think that there's room for um, the game to move, uh, to bifurcate and, and move into the, give some promotion and some investment into the classic game. Because I think that's the, the great game, in my opinion. And I know people that have played, the older folks that have played the classic game would, I think would unanimously agree. It's pretty much across the boards. It, it was a better game as far as athleticism and a sport better now. So two different things. No reason that they can't live parallel to one another. Other sports have done it. The NFL, you, you know, football in America here, you had the uh, Canadian rules football. They had arena football. You know, I think in, uh, in you know, rugby, there's different versions, rugby league and union and Australian rules football. And, you know, you have games that are kind of similar. Um, cricket, I think there's a couple different versions of, of the game. Certainly in billiards, you know, you got eight ball, you got nine ball, you got uh, three cushion, you know, uh, other um, games that, that are, you know, probably forgetting a few of them. But you, you can have these games existing where everyone can pick the game that they want to play. This whole idea that it has to be forced on onto us, um, you know, and and you know, we and uh, Vic Wilk and I, my my traveling partner you know we decided oh, we'll just let's go back and do a persimmon and blades event so we did three three or four of them uh in las vegas back 2000 i think it was maybe 10 11 12 13 somewhere in there and uh, we just played uh persimmon woods and blade irons and uh, we used the uh, the soft softest ball that we could find you know not the longest ball and um we just kind of rolled the rules back to rules that just made sense uh, I think if anything, the rules of the game needed to be looked at, and and it, it's interesting that they did make some changes, like putting with the flag in again. You know that was banned for a long, long time. It never made sense to me. That was so we we were doing that back 2010, 11, uh, putting with the flag in, and and we had a universal drop procedure, which was an original original rule way back in the 1800s, Golf Club of Leith, and they had a distance penalty. So. You know, it, you could take relief from the watery filth. <laughs> That's what they called it. And it was seven yards or more. It was, you know, actually mentioned a distance. So what we did is we just made uh, we made the rules so that you didn't need rules officials, basically. Uh, you would play the ball as it lies, period. That's it. Play it as it lies. Unless you wanted to take relief. And then you relief meaning you could put the ball back in the fairway and then we go back 30 yards 30 yards you know if we're all hitting seven irons up here and some guy's back there with a four iron then nobody cares where he's dropping you're dropping here over here no, you don't care about that you're three clubs back so we implemented this for out of bounds uh we implemented this for lost ball unplayable lie anything you didn't like if your ball was on a cart path well you know if, it, if you're scared of hitting it off the cart path, then you could just take a putter and just put it off the cart path. You know, if you're worried about hurting your clubs or whatever, then just do that. If you wanted to just take a rip at it with a three wood or something, I had a shot like that where I hit it, I actually hit it off the cart path in the tournament, used the two wood and on a par five and I knocked it on the green uh, 15 feet and made eagle. So, you know, it was kind of, yeah, put a little scrape on the bottom of my club, but hey, I made an eagle, you know, it helped me win the tournament that year, you know. Um, so these are the kind of things that should probably be addressed more, uh, things to speed up play. Um, you know, the provisional ball rule, I think was, a very, uh, suspect w rule. You know, someone hits a ball off to the right, oh, I'm going to hit a provisional, then they hit the ball off to the left. Now you're looking for that ball for five minutes and then you're looking for this ball for five minutes, you know? So you got 10 minutes and then you got a couple groups coming up and holding up on the tee. I remember playing in in Australia in the West Australian Open at a course called Joondaloo. And there was a par three that was a, out of the sunken quarry rocks and everything. And it was an extremely difficult hole. And I remember walking up to the tee and there were four groups on the tee because there were so many lost balls and provisionals and unplayables and all this stuff. People kept walking back to the tee. You know, that, that stuff's just gotta be eliminated. You know, that, that it just needs to be thought, thought through a little bit better. So, um, no one should ever have to walk all the way back to the tee. I mean, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. 
uh, put the ball back into play, one shot penalty, that makes sense. Go back 30 yards, maybe it's a shot and a half penalty now, right? Universal, so what's the problem? You got a problem with this? Well, do you want to take a drop? Well, there's no free drops, you know, it's just it. You just play the conditions, that's it. If you're in water, well, you're gonna hit it out of the water. If you don't, take your drop and go back middle of the fairway, go back 30 yards, take a shot penalty. It, it just eliminated all of that. And we were getting around with amateurs in a pro-am format, we were getting around in three hours and 45 minutes. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine competitive professional golf, kind of like the uh, AT&T Crosby tournament or pro-am format, a couple amateurs, pros playing together. Three hours and 45 minutes, we were getting around what was the old Sahara Country Club in Las Vegas, Las Vegas National League, between you two. So, so we did that, so, and, and you know what? Everybody had a great time, and it was a professional event, and we had a pro uh, that would win the tournament and have a check for real money, you know? Um, it worked, it was just fine. There was, nobody complained, not one person complained about this. Actually, people loved it and thought it was great. And we did it a few years just to kind of put it out there. That was our TRGA, Traditional Rules of Golf Association. Had it, wrote up the rules, just one page, simple, simple game. And went out and played. And, uh, you know, it worked really well. And kind of interesting that some of those rules that the USG adopted a few years ago, so I think they kind of read what we were doing, actually, because it's almost the same thing. So another thing, you know, in, in the rules, and again, you know, I'm just, just <coughs> recycling back here. What is this all about? The, the rules of the game, you know, the integrity of the game. And I think that, you know, the biggest problem that there's ever been in the rules is the um, slow play and having a, the universal drop procedure, something along those lines, would be so much more beneficial to the game than to be worrying about, uh, you know, the ball going another 20 yards or something like that. And just, uh, Getting back to the, TJ, the TRGA events that we did. So let's say, for instance, with the universal drop procedure, you've got a, a par four or a par five, you got water all the way down the right side, what they would call lateral hazard. Okay, so you got a guy teeing off on the right side of the tee box and he hits a hook, hits it way out over the water and he's drawing it back to the ferry, but it doesn't quite make it back and it lands in the water this far from the, from the, uh, from the edge of the, of the land. And according to lateral water hazard rule, it's where the ball crossed the hazard, which was right off the tee box. Let's say 20 or 30 yards off the tee box, two club lengths and at side hill lie and in grass this deep and you're having to drop or whatever. Another guy in the group, hits it down the middle of the fairway, but his ball slices and it lands this far from the other ball that was hooked into the water, lands in the water, but it crosses way, way down in the fairway, almost uh, where his ball entered the water. So both players hit the same shot or in the water. The balls are in the water. They're this far from each other in the water. One was a hook, didn't quite make it back to the shore. The other one went down the fairway. They end up in the same place. One guy's got to drop right off the tee. Maybe there's a slope going down or you know some horrific situation. The other person gets two club lengths from the water's edge, another two, 230 yards down the fairway. Uh, that's not fair. That doesn't make any sense at all. Universal drop procedure. Both these players would be dropping in the same place. They would go, here's the ball. We go back to the middle of the fairway. We go back 30 yards, drop the ball. They're both hitting the same shot. Uh, speeds up play, no provisional balls, no lost ball, no going back to the tee, none of that stuff. So, I, I mean, the, these would be, if, if they're going to make uh, adjustments to the rules, they should do things like this to speed up play and to make the game more uh, equitable, more fair, on, you know, certain things like that with rules. So, you know, get it. getting back to, let, let me just finish up here. I know it's been quite... Uh, a war and peace here today, but uh, I'm reading here from their uh, official press release. Since the USGA and RNA have been consulting with the industry about the problem which they declare is beginning to undermine the core principle that golf should require a broad range of skills to be successful. What? Okay. Let, let, let me get this. Let me read this again. 
The USJ and the RNA have been consulting with the industry? Okay, if this is a game, I don't think there's any need to consult with the industry. Okay, this is a game. The purpose of the USJ and the RNA, RNA are to be the steward of the game, to protect the rules and the integrity of the game. It doesn't have anything to do with the industry. You think in baseball, uh, if they're going to make a, you know, a wooden bat, they're going to go to the industry and say, hey, uh, what do you guys think uh, we should do here with our legal bats? I mean, it, it, this just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and which they declare is beginning to undermine the core principle of golf. Beginning? Like this is just now happening? Uh, 30 years ago, it was beginning to undermine the core principle that golf should require a broad range of skills to be successful. So that broad range of skills would be your par four holes. If you've got 10 par fours, three of them requiring long irons, two, three, and four iron. Four of them requiring mid irons, five, six, seven, and three requiring short irons, eight, nine, and wedge. Your really long courses might have four of these long ones and three mid-range and three short. Um, th that's, that's the broad spectrum. That's what they're, they should be talking about, the, uh, that golf should require a broad range of skills to be successful. Long iron play off the fairway, that, that's been just gone for 20, 30, 30 years now. Um, they're, they're declaring uh, that this is just beginning to be a pro. I mean, what? 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 Really? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. All right. All right. Um, then they go on that this is just one concern in a in a debate that has been raging for decades. Classic courses are in danger of becoming obsolete. What? Classic courses are in danger. They've been obsolete for 30 years. I mean, what are they talking about here? What? what? Th this is this happened 30 years ago. Classic courses have been obsoleted by technology. Uh, players such as Rory McIlroy and John Ram. Wh why are they mentioning these specific players or uh, uh, singling these guys out? There's plenty of players that are hitting the ball 350 yards, launching. Rory McIlroy and John Ram routinely launch drives of 350 yards plus reducing the test in some cases to a drive pitch and putt this has been happening for how long now I mean, in the early 2000s i was watching guys hit short irons into 13 and 15 at augusta so this is they're, they're acting like this is just starting they created this they the usj and the rna started this whole thing okay uh, now they're saying it's a problem i mean i, I you know <laughs> i mean Okay, seriously? Um, yeah, uh, uh, I don't even know what to say to that. Um, longer courses are required, resulting not only in the nature of layouts being stretched, sometimes beyond recognition, and then there is the obvious rise in maintenance costs with the necessity for extra water and chemicals, uh, fueling environmental worries, rounds are inevitably taking longer to compete even in club, championship, club competitions. Okay, so, I was saying this, uh, you know, 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and you know, nobody would even listen. Uh, we did the TRGA events in Vegas uh, as kind of like, hey, let's just, you know, do, I, I don't even know, to, reading this is, it's like a, a comedy, it's like Saturday Night Live skit or something. I mean, they should, they should do a, a skit on this or something, I mean, the USGA's. They're finally coming to their senses. I mean, like I said, the cat is so far out of the bag. It's not in the neighborhood anymore. It's not in the city anymore. It's not in the county. It's not even in the country. It's not even on this earth anymore. I, I don't even know what, what to say about this. Um, I, I, you know, uh, th this whole press release here, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't, it, it, it's incredible that they would come out now and say this. So no, 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 no. If they want to grow the game, you grow it sideways from here. You keep the game intact. You have a whole generation of players that have been playing this super golf version. That's what they know. That's what they've trained for. Leave that intact. And you want to grow the game. Then you have a persimmon and blade tour and you start that. 
and you play the class of courses as they were intended. Long irons into, into three or four of the par fours. Par fives are three shot holes, not two shot holes. Um, when I won on the uh, Canadian Tour in 1991, I was never on a par five and two all week. Not once. Didn't hit any of the par fives and two. They were three shot holes. They were par fives. Three shots to the green. Two putts. One putt for a birdie. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's too far. We're talking about golf that has now turned into a different game, the, a different sport, from golf being a game to golf being a sport. I think that's what's happened. Uh, they should both exist. I, I support what's going on now. Just leave it alone. Let them do that. My, my argument has been that it, the game should bifurcate and have a separate version that's a respectable version that the persimmon and blade balada type of golf should be promoted, supported financially, uh, champions crowned in that game. And I don't see any reason why that shouldn't happen. It should. All the classic courses suddenly become relevant again. And you could have great tournaments on these great courses. And you could occasionally have players from the these other leagues, whether it's the PJ Tour or, the, or this new tour, uh, could come in once in a while. It'd be interesting to see some of those top players come and play in the United States Persimmon Open or the Persimmon Professional Golf Tour. Uh, a little crossbreeding in there would be interesting, I think, for the press and the media to uh, discuss. That's how it could grow sideways, and then everyone would be happy. Uh, if you're playing eight ball and pool, you're playing nine ball, three cushion, whatever game, you just play the game that you want to play. And all of those, these other sports, uh, you know, there's baseball, softball, people love baseball, people love softball. Softball is not as big as baseball, but people love playing softball. Corporate events, softball, business, uh, people get off work and go play a game Friday night of softball. It's a lot of fun. People enjoy it. Um, no reason that that shouldn't be the problem is trying to force this on everybody uh, i don't like it being forced on me i don't like my main thing is having to use uh, soft spikes i don't like them uh, i i can't swing the club the way that i want to i need more grip and grip pressures into the ground steel spikes are better than the soft spikes for the golf swing i don't like that that's been taken away on a local rule level at 99% of golf courses. Uh, these are the kind of things that are that should be addressed. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I, I guess I'm, I was, didn't mean to speak so long today. Uh, I was hoping to maybe get this done in five or 10 minutes and it's probably been three hours or something. But anyway, that's about all I have to say. Um, there's nothing more I can say, I don't think. And I'll leave it at that and we'll see you next time on Advanced Ball Striking.